Hi guys, welcome to the first episode of It's a Woman's World, an inclusive space for women and young girls to connect and lift each other up as we hear from inspiring women leaders from all over the world. I'm your host, Gary Rangu, and today we are joined by Ms. Laura Satrakian, who is the co-founder and CEO of News Deeply, an award-winning media company that provides a platform for underrepresented global issues. A graduate of Harvard University, Laura has also worked as a Middle East correspondent for ABC News and Bloomberg Television. These experiences barely scratch the surface of her inspiring accomplishments and advocacy in the news industry. I just want to take a moment and thank you for joining us today. I'm so excited to have you as our first guest on It's a Woman's World. So let's get right into the podcast. Uh, to start us off, could you please introduce yourself and tell us how you first got involved in the news and journalism industry? Was it a passion you developed from a young age or an interest you discovered later on? It's so good to be with you. and. Thank you for the question. I was a junior in high school when I heard a guest speaker coming to one of our assemblies and talking about war reporting. He was actually a producer at 60 Minutes. Oh I was blown away. And I had family that had come from some countries that had seen conflict. So the ability to be sensitive to those conflicts and to pay attention and to be mindful, right down to the choice of word you use and how you close the piece really struck me in a way that was uh, life-changing. So I wrote to that speaker and asked if I could be his intern for the summer. Didn't expect to hear back, but he said yes. Uh, and that internship, my junior year of high school really set the stage for me to pursue this as a life goal. When I got to Harvard, I already knew this is what I wanted to do. So I really made the most of access to the IOP, Harvard Radio Broadcasting. That's really where I went to continue to develop those interests and to start practicing the craft. There was no YouTube. So <laughs> I was very happy on the radio. I was very happy broadcasting during 9-11 and you know, and frankly, meeting incredible people through the Kennedy School who made a lot of opportunities possible for me. I'm a kid from just a normal family. We didn't have any extraordinary insights on how to break into media, but just um, being there, being present, showing up for all the opportunities that were there in college, and then doing my very best whenever an opportunity was given, uh, created the momentum and a lot of the the extraordinary uncommon chances that I've had to be a journalist and then to take a chance on shaping journalism in different ways. Right. I think like the fact that you ended up emailing the producer that came to your school is like a like the no, great no, example. I didn't email him. I wrote him a letter. Oh, you wrote him <laughs> letters. You wrote him a letter. Okay, that shows that like. It really does take like putting in that initial step or like first effort to like start your uh, journey. I think um, that's something I've been trying to learn throughout college that there are so many resources available at Harvard and just beyond the community. Um, but it really takes like kind of putting yourself out there and whether that's writing a letter or like writing an email, going up to the professor's office hours and just asking because um, like that one simple thing could lead to an internship and, you know, end up shaping a career. So I think that um, that's a really cool experience that you had. Um, but moving on to what your typical day looks like, what does a typical day look like in your role? And what is your favorite part of the job? So I got a chance to lead News Deeply for almost a decade. And it's not what I do day to day now, but it's always running in the background. Uh, it's archived with an amazing publication called The New Humanitarian. And I'm constantly thinking about if I had to pick one consequential issue to launch with next, what would it be? So I see the world in stories I always have. And in particular, as someone who cares about the species, I think about what issues as a species I don't think we're communicating very well about or that we that could use some clarity and understanding. I'm very sensitive to the fact that everyone has the same news pool. So if you're someone trying to solve a major global issue, or trying to understand what's happening, in, in my case, in the Syrian conflict a decade ago when we started, you don't have much more than what everyone else has. So if major news networks aren't covering that issue or not paying attention to what's going on in the field where you work, you don't have much to go on. And so I conceptualize news deeply as news for the people working the problem those who are genuinely interested and need that information. And we better hope that they're gonna get it because they're the ones who are gonna make the difference on our planet as to whether that issue is solved or not. Uh, 
I think we run, I mean, if you came down from a totally fresh perspective from outer space and looked at how our species communicates, it would make no sense. It would actually be very self-defeating and yeah. quite, fr quite frivolous really. Uh, and while I don't begrudge anyone the fun and frivolous, I do think we have a responsibility as journalists and communicators to figure out how we're helping people make sense of the world. No matter right. how mad it gets, at the end of the day, that's our job is, is can we make this world make sense for everybody else? And so that's a high concern to me. Uh, and in the end, it actually was more important for me to try to be an entrepreneur and to try to solve for what I thought was a broken information system than to stay mm -hmm. on television, despite having loved the job that I used to have on television. <laughs> um, I loved my job reporting on the Middle East, but I couldn't ignore that. I think structurally the way news and information was working was not very effective for the species and wasn't doing justice to the people who were in these issues and, and right. suffering in these conflicts. They often were made into either a, a total fetish. It's everyone's obsessed with Syria one day mm -hmm. and then nothing about it they get obsessed right. with everybody in the newsroom and every they're all the different networks run for the same soccer ball you get wall-to-wall -wall coverage of something in obsessive fashion and then it disappears right yeah whatever happened to that country or story you actually don't have a lot of follow-up so you know so that's that's you know as an entrepreneur my days were, were a mix of everything as a mm -hmm. tv journalist is a little more structured, you know, you're going on at a certain time or something breaks more or less. I mean, being a journalist is really fun. Yeah, you, it does look like that. <laughs> really, really fun. The only problem is until we figure out how to pay for quality information 24 hours a day, you do a lot of stories that you feel are not really exactly what the species needs right now or not really, you know. So I do think that changes if you work in public broadcasting. I think PBS NewsHour, NPR, these are places where you do journalism that matters every second of the day. Right, uh, yeah. So it depends on what you're in it for. Mm -hmm. But my days were always full and I was just always ready to take on a huge challenge. <laughs> I, never made, I could never sort of settle into something that wasn't massively challenging. I would find another way to spin it and so I went from producing the news as a journalist to uh, creating platforms to experiment with different formats in the quest for more continuous coverage of issues that really matter. These are these are underrepresented issues that we did news deeply have done news deeply platforms on ocean health, Arctic, many issues in the Arctic, uh, women and women's empowerment, women's advancement, refugees, Syria, peace building, Ebola during the Ebola crisis. Mm -hmm. We were asked. To and we looked at doing a pandemic steeply in 2015, 2016. We were told there would be no interest. So, you know, we, it was pretty clear. We had a special way of assessing, you know, obviously we have a good sense of story, but is this something that's about to pop and that we have a massive deficit of information that we need to try to make up for? Right. Um, and so we had our way of, of picking out what we thought would be the right topics to focus on. And once we did, we just did our best to cover it with high integrity and satisfy the hardest customers who are the ones who really know the issue. And to have done that was really the honor and distinction of a lifetime. Right. I mean, when I think of entrepreneur, I never would have thought that journalism would come hand in hand as well. So like learning mm -hmm. about your journey and your story has been like very eye opening to me that um, there is such a big def deficit, as you mentioned, in covering these stories that on you know news televisions and national television is just one day 24 hours on that specific country and then the next day um yeah. i've experienced it like we hear nothing about it until the next big thing happens um so it's very inspiring that you're putting a spotlight on these people that don't have this um the voice for themselves um and also you know kind of spreading that issue to others in the way the news works now is a disservice to all of us and not yeah. all of it, a lot of the way, a lot of the dynamics in the news in the news media are doing a disservice to all of us. When I was at Harvard, it was theoretical and academic. Oh, you need this kind of thriving quality yeah. information for a healthy democracy. And it was all theoretical. And now we don't have a healthy democracy. And I think we see the role information plays. Uh, it's much harder to fix afterward. But if you take it on the landscape of a specific story, and I did make life a little easier for myself that we 
built a model around serving the people who really need that information. So he never really had, oh, nobody cares about X, issue X. Well, there's a core group that absolutely cares about issue X. Yeah. And vitally, desperately needs to know what's happening around issue X. So that's what we set as our audience target and then everything else we built around it. Yeah. So talking more about your journalism, what has been one of the most rewarding and inspiring stories that you've had the opportunity to cover? Definitely the Egypt revolution. I, it was like a lifetime ago, you were very small, I guess. <laughs> I'm a person now, but um, the Arab uprisings, even though now we, we've seen that they haven't resulted in the kinds of societies that everyone was yearning for or, or rallying mm -hmm. for, they were an unbelievable moment in human uh, courage and solidarity. And so, you know, I covered specifically, I was live on television when the former president of Egypt, Hosni Mubarak, resigned, which was a very big deal, which was a very big deal. Nobody ever would have imagined it five weeks earlier. Mm -hmm. And to be on a balcony and to hear the energy of the crowd after watching them, you know, they stayed in Tahrir Square as protesters for weeks under uh, gunfire, under um, Molotov cocktails, literally like fire bombs being thrown on their heads. And so they, and they were incredibly, you know, incredibly tight knit. They were supporting each other, cooking for each other, Muslim, Christian, everybody was just in it together and witnessing that human solidarity and then witnessing the resignation of a dictator in the face of that and the, and the hope it was it was very special right um you know given like the state of today's world and the political atmosphere do you find yourself holding on to that hope um in that moment you witnessed watching a group of people basically overcome a dictator well i think i've seen a lot of darkness frankly we all have um i've seen it a lot up close but i know where i go for the reverse as well mm -hmm. And so I find a lot of hope in human solidarity. I find hope in innovation, in uh, kindness, in, you know, and everywhere I've gone where things are going horribly, you know, Mr. Rogers said, look for the helpers. There are always helpers, people helping and extraordinary acts of bravery or endurance. Uh, so I've, you know, just people's commitment to keep building and keep continuing on is amazing. The little kindnesses, the hospitality, the grace that runs through people. Uh, that's what gives me hope. And I don't have kids. I want to do my part to make things a little better than they are. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, I don't, I don't think doing nothing is an option. Right. And so, and, and you find it, you find it. You know, I've been, all of us, and I think all of us who've covered wars and conflicts and been, been in them, you know, you do get burned out, you do get disillusioned, you do, do get disheartened. Um, entrepreneurship, you take quite a beating, you're up, it's a very intense ride, but you, makes you find your center and mm -hmm. makes you really recognize where your calm and your joy comes from. And then you go with it for, and you stick with it. So I'm, I'm, I don't regret any piece of this journey, uh, but it's not always easy either. Right, of course. I think like as uh, a college student, just a fresh one, um, I feel very torn apart, especially going to Harvard where a lot of the focus seems to be on that university and what the students are doing. Um, but it's been very hard to kind of find like a certain center or ground um, to kind of go back to like what, uh, like my initial core values and what I want to do for the rest of my life in terms of how I want to make that impact. The um, most important thing. And I yeah. think it's if you're like Harvard that can be so competitive, you really can lose your mm -hmm. sense, of, sense of balance. Right. Um, and I think in general, the world makes it easy to lose your balance. Yeah, and I've learned that like, I've had to like kind of, I think it's important to learn how to like step back from the, you know, fast world of competitiveness and, you know, advancing yourself um, and just kind of taking a step back and asking yourself like what matters to you and what do you want to do with, this Harvard education because it's not given to us just for no reason. There's a purpose with it. And 
um, it's de really depends on you whether or not you want to take that degree and do something great for the world and, you know, help real people, people or, um, you know, just kind of take a seat in the back and enjoy the ride. But um, I'm, I'm very glad that I found your story because I think it's so helpful to, especially like young girls like me that, you know, are kind of searching for a certain direction, um, even if they're not going into journalism, just seeing how women like you kind of paved their path um, despite all the darkness in our world and you know all these conflicts that are happening. And um, so I guess the next question is, how has your identity as an Armenian American shaped your approach as a journalist and entrepreneur? I think being a minority is a real blessing. I think the ability to see two different worlds or more and then to empathize with people from different worlds. And it's not unique to being an ethnic American, but I do think I got it from being an ethnic American. Mm -hmm. Also, Armenian culture is full of, of beauty and full of strength. And so I think being Armenian made me a better and stronger person for all of my life. And there are times when it's hard, we're persecuted people. I live in Armenia and we've been through some hard, hard wars and conflicts in the recent, recent memory. We're survivors of a genocide that wiped out almost all of us uh, more than a hundred years ago. And so I do think it does get hard when you, when you are a survivor nation because mm -hmm. there's a certain degree of trauma that comes with that. And that can drive you crazy. It can drive you to overwork. It can drive you to self-doubt. It can drive you to anxiety. It can drive you to a lot of things. But, you know, I've, I've personally worked with that and looked at that uh, and how to overcome it and really to just enjoy being who I am and enjoy the culture I come from. You know, I've been part of this region. I, 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 was, I sort of grew up in New Jersey dreaming of covering the Middle East. And now that we have 23andMe, I know that my maternal haplogroup has been exactly where I am right now, talking to you wow. for 47,000 years. Oh <laughs> my gosh. Cultivation of, of agriculture. So it's beautiful, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to know who you are, whether that's because you know your ethnic background or some other element that is core to you or core to where you come from or core to who you know you are. To know who you are is a beautiful thing. and so. Uh, being Armenian, it was a wonderful thing. And also, of course, you know, as a as a people that have been through a lot, you just naturally empathize. I couldn't see the Syrian war and not do something about it because Syrians took us in when we were when we needed it, when we were barefoot and hungry and abused. And uh, my grandfather's born in Aleppo. You know, a lot of Armenians who survived the genocide ended up in Syria and then went on to the West. So. I think it's been a great, great gift. It's been a great gift to, to, to grow up Armenian American has been a great gift and it's a calling as well. I take it as a calling. I've covered problems all around the world and now I'm at a stage in life where I also want to help solve them. Right. And that's convening and public policy and acceleration of all kinds. It's, it's time to put what I've learned to work and so you know, I do feel that weight so that, you know, we all, we all are proud of the work we've done in the time that we had. Right. Actually, I think the course, <laughs> went to the course of the Kennedy School, you're way too young to have to deal with this, but maybe you, you enjoy it anyway. But I went back to the Kennedy School for a module in 2018, I believe, or 27, 2018, I think it was. Um, and they basically asked our class, if you went poof tomorrow, what would you most regret not having done? Basically, in so many words, like if you disappeared tomorrow, what would you most regret not having done? And it was very clear to me that I would most regret not having come back to the places that my family's from and shared what I've learned out in the wider world and be a builder and a capacity builder. And a, of course, always a communicator and a journalist and a storyteller, but that it has to be the case that I, not I alone have benefited from my right. experience. Um, and so I'm very, I'm very thankful that, that that has made my life richer, better, and the karmic upsides are unbelievable. The way these things spiral upward into beautiful moments and friendships and other opportunities you never would expect. It's only, I've followed my conscience at every turn of my career and it hasn't let me down. Right, of course.
I think identity is like a very um, moving part of anyone's journey. And I think for me personally, being Indian American, it has been quite a struggle to kind of find that balance of being American and Indian um, and just kind of wanting to stay true to my roots back home in India. Um, and so I think college has been very helpful in terms of how I want to give back to the Indian community. Um, and I think now my family and I are going to India for the next two weeks pretty soon. And um, I haven't been there in eight years, but I feel like as now as a young woman, I'm going into that trip with a new lens and, um, you know, wanting to kind of help these communities that I've always walked around or I just never really paid attention to. And um, right. I think hearing your story has been very, you know, inspiring that so, you're starting right. from the ground. Where in India? Hyderabad, so South Indian. Nice. Um, my parents are from there. And so um, I feel very connected to it. And I'm I'm very nervous, but also very excited to go back to India because I think I've been in America way too long. So I'm not sure, um, I guess, in terms of fitting in how I'll, how I'll be. <laughs> balance. <laughs> yeah. Balance. Um, it all yeah. fits. Yeah. It all fits in one life, luckily. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but, you know, as a woman, of course, um, you definitely have faced some challenges um, in a male dominated industry. So what has been one of the biggest challenges you've had to face while working in the newest industry? And, you know, how have you tried to overcome it? And um, what how has that led you to where you are today? I don't know if I overcome it. I think it's very hard as a woman in a visual industry not to constantly judge yourself on how you look. Um, and that's weight, that's hair, that's coloring, that's features. Um, and to know that actually probably subtly or not so subtly you're being judged on it and that it's one element of your momentum, career momentum, it's hard. It's hard. I wish I could coach the 25 year old version of me that went through that. Um, and I don't think that it's past despite all of the moments of empowerment or me too. I don't know that that's past. Mm -hmm. uh, we're beyond it. Um, I think the closest I've come is that I've recognized at a certain point when I started going on TV more as an expert than a correspondent. And I realized what I have to share is important and it's not about my hair. In this case, I'm very close to the ground and I better get across the things I would always prepare for a TV spot by really thinking about what are the three key things I really want to make sure people know by the end of my time on TV. Um, and it sounds a bit trite, but it, it was a truth. Okay, what are the three things? What are the things I really want to make sure to get across? I would never wing it. So what are those three things? And if I, when I was a correspondent, I'd go on every hour, I'd always try to make sure they were three different things. I didn't like repeating myself. I thought people need something new. So, so it's really, um, I think it's hard not to undermine yourself in your head as a woman and feeling constantly judged, you start to judge yourself, especially when you succeed, then you feel like that was justified. You were judged and you better keep up whatever you were judged on. Uh, I don't know. I, I think that I'm in a place of peace in general now mm -hmm. at my age and stage. And I wish I could just bottle that up and give it to everyone who's in their twenties. Um, but I mean, I don't want to curse on your very public podcast, <laughs> no. but I, um, at a certain point, you just have to tell yourself it doesn't effing matter. It just yeah. doesn't matter. If this is the place I'm going to get judged because I'm not as hot as the next girl or this person didn't, you know, it doesn't effing matter. You go on and do something else, you know, get quality work done and it will rise and you will rise. And okay, what's one, it's it, when you haven't had 20 jobs yet, you've only had one or two, one being a toxic, terrible place that you have to walk out of feels like a disaster. But in the long view, it's actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just doing the quality work and recognizing that the stuff that is toxic or the stuff that is unempowering is not worth it. And it doesn't right. matter there will be other opportunities. And if you walk away from the wrong types of environments, you'll find yourself in the right ones pretty soon. And that's not being too picky or unrealistic or idealistic. 
you know, I think I think you we do have we're we're a generation that hasn't been taught self discipline the way past generations were taught. So I do think mm -hmm. we all probably step up our self discipline game. But once you know that you're being diligent and you're doing the work and you're doing the right thing and you're not being just like a, you know, I don't know. Uh, a frivolous whiny person you're a serious and you're a good person you're doing good work if you're being judged on your looks or if you're being undermined or if you're in a truly toxic environment and you have a thick skin and you get it I, I had such a thick skin that I took it all but in retrospect you know I shouldn't be judged on that stuff you shouldn't be you would judge on the quality of your work right and if people really want to prioritize a certain look or a certain mainstream sense of beauty, and that's not what you have, then it's not the place for you. Yeah, I think being in college, like I definitely have had a lot of experience with toxic, in toxic environments, and ones that are like very ones that are very nourishing and um, helpful in terms of personal development. Um, and so I think you know, learning from you, it's really about letting that passion drive you um, through all the ups and downs of uh, someone's journey. Uh, so it's very helpful to hear that, you know, it's, it is a kind of a universal experience for women, but there are ways to come out of it. Um, and especially when you're so passionate about something, I agree that um, at some point you do have to kind of say F it and, you know, go for your work and go where your heart leads. Earn respect. Yeah. Respect is a completely different flavor than judgment. Mm -hmm. you earn people's respect. Good things happen. And, it, and right. you can't find their respect without doing good things and doing good work and being a diligent, hardworking person. So, you know, aim for the respect of the people you respect. Yeah. And I do, there are models of success in this world that are brutal, that are judgmental. And then there are models of success that are more relational mm -hmm. and they're no less rewarding and no less enriching in every sense. You can be a huge success. You can be an intellectual powerhouse going through pathways that are more nourishing. I think it's a fallacy that you have to go through these brutalist environments in order to achieve excellence. I don't believe it. And I've been through most, I've been through a lot of them. And looking back, I think they cause as much anxiety as they do acceleration. Mm -hmm. So if you can get the acceleration without the anxiety, then you really win the game. Yeah, I think, um, you know, kind of how I want to shape my journey um, into my later years. Like I really want to, focus on having, building relationships and finding mentors because uh, I found that in my past in my first year like at Harvard to be very um, you know fundamental to like what I want to do in the future um, and I feel like I've ended up in a really good place at the end of my first year um, a lot due to the fact that like I kind of sought out certain professors or certain upperclassmen students that were very nourishing as you said and um, kind of understood that um, you know, I'm going to make mistakes, but they're also very pivotal in the path that I'm going to uh, take further on. Yeah. Um, but, you know, <laughs> well, you can always call me because <laughs> we're here for you. We're on your team and it's going to be great. Whatever you choose Thank to you. do, it'll be great. I really Starting. appreciate it. <laughs> Um, actually, like when I was very young, my dad would always put on like ABC World News with Diane Sawyer and then it was David Muir. Um, and like their form of broadcasting and reporting was always so captivating to me. Um, and so there was like a little period where I did want to be like that journalist that was on the news like every day. Um, but then I learned for, later on that it's like a very like uh, fast paced job. You could be up like 5, 4 a.m. I don't know. <laughs> but I think just the fact that you have that that position and that influence to really tell those stories to such a big audience, I think was just so inspiring and captivating. And then, you know, seeing those specials on like every, uh, every night of like reporters on the ground, like you were and like you are right now. And just like sharing that information with someone as young as I was, um, that was just amazing to me. Um, anyway. But I don't know, <laughs> maybe I'll do it later on in the future, but <laughs> <laughs> but you know, yeah. you find the right answer and you know you're doing the right things which will get you to the right answer yeah yeah <laughs> but um I guess kind of wrapping up because I think we have about 10 minutes left um speaking of Harvard I would love to hear a bit more about your experience I know you touched on on uh the Harvard radio network and IOP but how did your time at Harvard shape who you are today 
I think it gave me tremendous opportunities and great confidence. I do. I mean, I grew up at New York City High School, so I think you sort of get confidence as well from that environment. Um, it opened a lot of doors, above all, to be honest. And um, I might, you know, I, I do think it also it has it can be a hyper competitive space. So you have to watch out for what the, how that impacts you and not getting caught up in it. But wonderful friends, wonderful people. And of course, wherever you go in the world, you will find many other wonderful people. Uh, and that's what matters. Not all of them are wonderful, but the ones you'll find who are wonderful um, are, are terrific. So I'm very thankful. I could feel it was the right place for me. I was thankful that I was able to get in and go and felt it's just, it was, it was kismet. So I don't think I could have been myself with, that I know, the self that I know without that experience. Yeah, I already feel myself changing so much from when I was a senior and then my end of my first year at Harvard. And as soon as I stepped onto campus, um, when I was deciding between colleges, I knew that, you know, Harvard was the place for me. And I'm so glad that it ended up working out for me because I think ultimately it really is just, just the community there, whether that's, you know, like my roommates, my block mates or professors there, like everyone there. Um, and also I have met like, um, some not the best people but you know the people that will gravitate towards you because of the energy you put out um you know that has been very like just it's such an amazing experience and I'm very grateful for everyone that I've met um, whether they've had an amazing impact or maybe not so much because like it all ends up um shaping who I am and um yeah I I, I can't imagine myself at any other place um <laughs> but um, last question, what advice would you give to young women who are interested in going into the news and journalism industry, but are not sure where to start? Is there something you wish you had known before leaving college and entering the career world? If you're going to go into journalism, the best thing you can do is get obsessed with the things that you think you want to cover subject matter mastery or sub real approaching subject matter mastery is such a huge asset. You will find the relevant issues, the relevant questions to ask. So, you know, just get as expert as possible in things that you are interested in Latin America or Middle East or Islamic studies or whatever that you want to write about, whatever you want to write about. Learn, 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 learn. Focus more on the learning even than the craft of journalism. Because it's, I find it's most enriching to practice the craft of journalism on something that you passionately love and are interested in. Mm -hmm. It'll be far easier to find a compelling interview and write a great article. So start with the subject matter that you want to cover and learn the heck out of it and then start writing. And then, you know, you might be assigned a different field and you learn all about that. But it's the fastest path to doing great work. When I was just assigned to random ass topics and had to do TV spots or this or that, it just, it, it, it felt a little, yeah, a little, you know, shallow or didn't really click. But once I was covering things that I feel privileged to understand, I want to convey that understanding as effectively as possible. I want to put as much knowledge into every piece as I can. That's, you know, social media for me was the place I put the leftovers. I love the chance that I had to interview so-and-so. Only two minutes of it ended up in the story. The 48 remaining, I'm going to find a way to convey through social media. Right. I loved what I got to learn, and I don't want it to be stuck with me. So, you know, be generous and learn about what you care about, and then, and then start by doing journalism on that. Right. Um, I think something for me is, like, woman empowerment. And even if I am not going into journalism, I think, you know, just hearing like personal stories like yours um, is it's not only empowering, it's very empowering, of course, to other young girls, but it is a lot for me in terms of how I want to, you know, shape my impact in the world. And, um, you know, I think the legacy that everyone leaves here is very important. And so um, I think hopefully with this podcast, a lot of uh, young women are listening to you. And of course, like um, on my part, I'm very inspired by the work you've done. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for, um, you know, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for taking the time today to, um, you know, speak with me and uh, speak to the viewers about your journey. Um, it's all very inspiring. <laughs> Happy to be with you and stay in touch. Let yes, of course.
<laughs> I can't wait to live in Cabot House next year. I was so happy finding out that you were a uh, fish uh, once. <laughs> so I'll carry on that legacy. <laughs> have fun. It's a beautiful, beautiful, right. beautiful place. Yes, it is. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> And to our viewers and listeners, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope to see you guys on the next episode of It's a Woman's World. Bye.